So thanks for to everyone who's joining us here in, in Cape Town and for those of you joining us online. Um, this is uh, this event is a collaboration between two research partnerships, uh, the ICCRP and SIP. We will tell you more about both of those in a second. The International Canadian Child Rights Partnership, the ICCRP, brings together academics, practitioners, children and young people to examine how intergenerational partnerships can realise children's rights. And in addition to our primary research, we have what we call four transversal working groups, and they are looking at policy, ethics, theory, conceptual frameworks, and participatory methodologies. And so for the, the you're here today on behalf of the participatory methodologies working group. And this question has been kind of antagonizing us for a while. There's kind of growing recognition that childhood studies, both in terms of the work that we do as academics, but also as practitioners, is not having the kind of impact that we would like to see in terms of improving children's lives. And one of our collaborators, uh, Kristen Cheney, who will be speaking later in the series, has pointed the finger firmly at patriarchy within the academy, but also an over-reliance on the pervasive and universalized children's right discourse in terms of the way that we frame our research. And she's called on us all to reflect on the ways in which we produce knowledge and to strive for epistemic justice. So, as I said, today is the first in a series of dialogues that we are organizing as the participatory methodologies working group to try and uh, forward that examination to, and to explore those ethical partnerships and approaches uh, to try to decolonize research with children and young people, with their carers and their communities. And the aim of this series is to give researchers and partners, whether they're practitioners and hopefully later in the series, some children in the global south, the opportunity to share their experiences of using participatory methodologies. And then we will, as the kind of at the end of the series, we will collectively reflect and um, interrogate how these approaches could potentially transform the research process to be both more responsive and impactful. Professor Kay Tisdall will introduce the SIP partnership and tell you about that in a moment. But first, I'd like to uh, give the floor to uh, Professor Widad Slamming, who has recently taken over as director of the, the Children's Institute. And she is going to help us to get into the mood by setting the scene with an overview of early years in South Africa. Thank you, Widad. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our international visitors to Cape Town. For those of you who haven't been here before, I'm sure you're really enjoying it. <laughs> and now I am. I'm a recent visitor. I'm not a visitor anymore, but I am now. Re I have relocated, so I'm enjoying it as probably as much as you are. Um, on behalf of the Children's Institute, we'd like to welcome you to the first conference dialogue in the series, in collaborative series with the ICCRP and the SIP Research Partnership. We look forward to an insightful and informative session sharing experiences, knowledge, and lessons learned, I think. Um, and I've been asked to start the afternoon's discussions really to provide some background on the situation of children in South Africa. South Africa, in many ways, is a country of contrast. It's an upper middle income country, but it's also the most unequal society in the world. It's a country in which all citizens have equal rights under our constitution. But the context in which you are born and, the, and your opportunities in life can be vastly different. However, in the world of averages, this is the, really what life looks like for children in South Africa today. We have roughly 20 million children in South Africa, about a third of our population. And I've decided not to focus just on the early years because I think we are more and more moving towards a life course approach in childhood studies. And lots of what affects children in early life continues right into adulthood. 
So to give you a picture of what children are born into today, nearly a third of them won't have access to safe drinking water in their homes. And about 20% won't have access to basic sanitation. Two thirds of our children in the poorest income quintile will live in households where no adults are employed. 15% of them will be born low birth weight. And as they grow up in early childhood, they will be either underweight. We've got 6% underweight children in South Africa today in the ages under five. 27% of them will be stunted, a figure that hasn't changed over three decades. And we've got a growing burden of overweight and obesity, highlighting that it's not only your burden of malnutrition or well, multiple burden of malnutrition, but also multiple intersecting burden, health burdens and health epidemics, both of acute illness and non-communicable diseases. These children, some of them will go to early learning programs, but we still have more than a million of them between the ages of three and five who do not access any le early learning programs at all. When they reach school, about three quarters of them will not be able to reach the lowest benchmark in reading scores, meaning they can't read with comprehension. About 40% of our grade five learners will achieve minimum competency in numeracy skills. About four out of 10 learners who start grade one will drop out before they reach matric or grade 12. They won't finish school. As they become adolescents and youth, about 60% of them will be unemployed. On top of that, more than a quarter of our adolescents have experienced some form of sexual abuse. And in a study conducted here in South Africa on the birth to 20 plus cohort, that Shanaz Matthews, our previous director, was involved in. They found that 99% of that cohort, more than 3,000 children between the ages of birth and 22 years, had been exposed to some form of violence, either in their home, school, or community. This is not a picture that we can be proud of. Added to that, 56%, more than a half of our children, percent, more than half of our children live below the upper bound poverty line meaning that they don't have enough to cater for their basic needs. This is not a picture that we should have as an upper middle income country. And sadly, this is the picture for many children across the world. I'm sure that many of you sitting here can reflect on situations similar to this for children in your own countries and in your own context. The use of participatory research methodologies helps us to better understand these environments and the lived experiences of children, their caregivers, and people in those communities, and aims to contribute, as Lucy stated, to the decolonization of childhood studies. Further, research that aims to put children at the center of inquiry and works with them to co-create contextually relevant studies, not only improves our work as researchers, but has the potential to influence and affect meaningful change for children, particularly those living in such vulnerable contexts and particularly unequal societies such as South Africa. I won't take, it, take up any more of your time because I think we're all really excited to hear about the exciting methodologies and approaches that have been employed in the SIP project. So I thank you and I'll hand over to Professor Kate Tisdall from the University of Edinburgh. Thank you. Thank you for so succinctly giving that context. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I'm Kay. Um, just want to start by saying how delighted I am to be here in Cape Town, but also with those of you online. I think these things are always a lot to organize. So really, um, thank you to the organizers for that um, and for uh, both ICCRP and SIP um, coming together in this way. So yes, I'm supposed to tell you what SIP is. So SIP is a four year project. And the acronym stands for Safe, Inclusive, Participative Pedagogy. Um, and it is particularly focusing on early childhood education. The funder put it out in terms of in fragile context. We don't really like that phrase. Haven't found a better phrase. Um, but that is what we're really concentrating on is early childhood education. And it's funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund. The funder will be happy I said that. Um, and the UKRI and ESRC. Um, and yep, so 
the project is um, with us at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so for my sins, I'm the principal investigator and many of our colleagues have been able to come today or online. So there's a team there and we're very much working with our partners who you'll be hearing from today. CSP um, from Brazil, uh, University um, of Eswatini, Bethlehem University from Palestine, um, and of course the Children's Institute from South Africa. So the project overall is not just interested in safe, inclusive, participative pedagogy in the abstract, but it's very much about how can we work um, in these contexts to find something that's implementable, that can make a difference, and also sustainable in terms of the government, communities, and families. So we've got quite a few work streams. You can go to our website if you want to know more about our work streams. Um, but for example, one work stream has been looking at policy mapping and system analysis. Another one's looking at the economic burden of violence, um, which relates to what you said for uh, children in their early years. Knowledge and exchange and impact is very big for us, so it's wonderful to have such a mixed audience uh, with us today to take that forward. And then the particular focus of today is uh, the work that's being done in particular communities with particular communities in terms of the objectives of the project. So I think you'll be hearing um, that each of the country partners have been working very intensively with their communities over COVID and more um, in really exploring these kind of issues with children, with parents yeah. and carers um, and other stakeholders. Uh, and all right. all right. OK. Yes, thanks. Oh, sorry, you, it's just Bye. coming over the microphone. So if people online just want to make make sure their microphones are muted. Is that what I should be saying? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. I'm doing that. <laughs> okay, so but really working um with the communities and all of those kind of different groups to really figure out how we can make the objectives of the project happen. Now we'll see, but I think many of the presenters are predominantly going to be talking about methodologies of with children, but we'll see. Um, and you can also ask questions in that regard. And I think the last task I have is just to say, uh, we're so welcoming of questions. There will be questions, um, but if you don't mind holding them on to the end uh, in that regard, although I guess it's the people online and post at any time. Yeah, <laughs> have I done my job? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Malibongwe Kwele. I work for the Children's Institute um, as a researcher. I am involved in this project. Uh, I am going to share with you one of the, or some of the methods that we use in this study. Um, I am not going to waste time because we don't have much time. The title of my presentation is the use of the persona doll, which is this guy here that I have, uh, that we use to engage with children uh, four to five years in participatory um, research. We are working in Freyhunt, which is the site for our research. Um, and we are um, having a um, number of um, research um, activities that have been undertaken there, but we will focus only today on the children's uh, part. We've done interviews with parents, ECD practitioners, community service organizations, and we have got an advisory group that is uh, assisting us in this research process, which we are proud of. And of course, True North, who is also an organization in the community that is working with us. To explore the understandings of um, uh, children and experiences or around the concepts that we're talking about, safety, inclusion, and participation, we used a combination of methods. All of them is a springboard to um, stimulate conversation. It's, it's the use of the persona dolls, which was the main method the book or picture sharing and uh, the drawing and, and telling exercise. The persona doll uh, was the main method as indicated. Uh, they are this tall, uh, 72 centimeters. 
and um, they come in various uh, color, size, and the you know color of hair, facial features are different. They were also, you know, uh, they have been used widely for trauma and diversity management in different settings. It's not so much that they have been used in research. So we are exploring this as a, as a very important tool working with children. The, these are some of the pictures of the persona dolls. And, and they have been very found uh, useful for foregrounding children's voices in research. Uh, uh, that's uh, what is coming from literature. And uh, if you, you know, integrate storytelling as part of that, uh, then it becomes very useful, especially that storytelling is very important in the African context and culture. So to supplement the dolls, we used drawings and 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 uh, invited children to tell something about their own um, experiences of the doll through drawings. Uh, towards the end of the sessions that we did. So what we we did, we um, had a facilitator, experienced facilitator who has been training the doll for many years. And we also, you know, spend time with her now so that she is not a trainer, she's a researcher, because sometimes it's very difficult to transition from being a trainer and, and being a facilitator of a research exercise. And uh, she used the doll to deliver stimulus stories or showing pictures around participation, inclusion, safety, and then engaging children through prepared questions and I tell you, we had to change those questions, how we frame questions many times, because sometimes children do not understand, especially in relation to the concepts that are difficult as the concept that we're dealing with, more especially participation and inclusion. To ensure that uh, the research process was of good quality, so um, one of our colleagues uh, developed a facilitator's guide with uh, children and the persona for the doll was developed and then we invited facilitators so that we can create a better understanding for all of us then we went to the advisory group to ensure that they also give input in the story because the persona doll is given a persona so that it can relate better to the children the guide was reviewed after the first two sessions and few adjustments were done sessions were delivered by highly experienced and trained facilitators and periodically we reflected together with the facilitators and the observers and we had to make adjustment to improve the experience and the engagement and uh, to complement the persona dolls especially around safety we used pictures uh, and we asked questions to children on the basis of uh, these pictures. And we wanted to understand whether these children in the picture are safe or not. Are they feeling safe and they not feeling safe? And then when to discuss spaces where children feel safe and feel unsafe. And there's so much that is coming out from the data, which I will not be able to share today at some other time. And, and then at the end of the session, we used the drawing to complement the doll as well. And we said, you spend five sessions with the doll, four sessions with the doll, and the fifth session, could you write your experience that you had, draw for us experience that you had with the doll? And these are some of the experiences. And it reflects the concepts that we're dealing with. And uh, as you may, may, may see, this one is mostly about, you know, including a, a girl in playing soccer. And, and that was very important for that particular child to say, all of us can play together. So there is no gender in playing soccer. And uh, in terms of the process, we did five sessions of approximately 25 minutes each. 
The first one is introduction. The three subsequent to that are dealing with each concept. And we plan to do safety at the end because it was the most uh, um, uh, common because of the context and the situation around children. And, uh, and, and a trained observer who spoke the local language and uh, we was leading the conversations with the children. And then we had an observer was sitting to observe and document the verbal and non-verbal expressions. And I think there was a lot of uh, non-verbal expressions that were that we would have missed if we were not having an observer. Because, uh, you know, when the story of the doll is told by the facilitator, you know, children would relate and they would show that uh, in, in the expressions of their face, how they relate to that story, and they begin to engage. And uh, of course, this uh, the use of the doll was very important for the children, and the doll actually commanded more respect mm -hmm. than the facilitator. And when we come without the doll, the children would ask, where is the doll? Where is chasing today? And when they make noise and not concentrating, and the facilitator would say, Jason is frustrated because you're making noise. And suddenly there will be silence. <laughs> but if one of us is saying you are not concentrating, they will continue to do what they were doing. Of course, there's a, there's a lot of agency amongst children. They uh, At the beginning of the sessions, they spend about three minutes, four minutes concentrating on what you're doing, and then they want to do what they want to do. So you must continuously bring the, back, them back to the discussion so that they can concentrate. So the level of engagement and identification with the doll was really um, expressed through spontaneously wanting to hug the doll. At the beginning, they would just be, you know, standing out afar from the doll, but as the sessions proceed, progress. They all want to take the doll home. They want to borrow the doll. They want to sing to the doll and do many things. So it was the most comfortable way of engaging with them and having them share their own life experiences uh, through this doll, which was quite, quite useful. I just want to share as I conclude uh, one of the, uh, some of the uh, emerging findings from one of the concepts. I won't be able to go through all the concepts, the concept of participation in terms of what it means for children in Freyhront. Uh, they indicated they are mostly happy in their preschool. And sometimes the teacher allows them to choose what they want to do. And I think we've spoken about this a lot during the, these two days. And uh, sometimes they felt that they cannot tell the teacher, the teacher tells them. One of them says, if you ask, if you say to the teacher, I don't want the porridge, the teacher says, you must finish your porridge. And, and, and one, of, one of them expressed how they, you know, have been engaging with their mother in, in, in terms of what, they, what, she, what he wanted to be when he is old. And she said, the, my, my mother wanted me to be a doctor, but I told her that I do not want to be a doctor. I wanted to be a firefighter. And, and that is, is also influenced by the number of fires that are happening in the community. Mm -hmm. She just wants to protect the community. And, uh, and, and uh, one of them, you know, boldly said, oh, if I'm asked to do dangerous things, I say no. No one can just force me to do things I do not want uh, to do. So these are some of the, the, the expressions that are coming from the data. It's still at early stages, but we are excited about what is emerging from the data. And I won't really go through inclusion and safety because of time, my time is already up. But we are seeing that uh, children feel safe. When, they ch when children feel safe, they participate and engage meaningfully. And that's what the doll provided for them. It made them to feel safe and feel engaged, and they were willing to engage with the doll, whatever the name was given to the doll on that particular day. But there is a process in which we prepared a, 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 a guide for the facilitator 
with the story, with the process that needed to be followed to ensure that uh, the doll is well received and is also can relate to the conditions and situation of the children in Freehold. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I will now invite our friends from Eswatini to continue with the conversation. Good evening or afternoon, everybody. My name is Lungi Letwala from Eswatini. I'm going to present with Dr. Shope. May she introduce herself. Evening for everyone. I am Dudu Shope from Eswatini as well, working for the Ministry of Education and Training. May I leave you for now? Thank you. You'll join me later. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to present on what we did on the field, but actually I'm going to present on methods that are found in our preschools in Eswatini. Uh, from our, in, our interviews, as we are moving around, that is what we found on the ground. So our presentation is built on that. So I'll talk about uh, my topic is entitled Aesthetical Subject in Outdoor Environment as Teaching Methods. So aesthetical subject include storytelling, drama, music, and art. Those are the subject. Uh, in a primary school language, we call them uh, practical arts. So how to use practical arts uh, in a preschool environment. So I see it necessary to hold a holistic view of children development to be able to see the connection between those three or four methods. So I'm not going to focus on one, but I'll look at all of them at once and how can we use all of them when we are teaching children. The main goal of a aesthetical project in preschool should be developing knowledge through singing, dancing, dramatizing, performing, and painting. So in other words, we are involving all the three or, or the four. I don't see where I am now. Okay. Other main issues are to understand the connection between art expression and children's play. During practical art activities, we use all senses. That is, children get knowledge about themselves and other people. Aesthetical expression among preschool children is important for many other developmental skills, such as emotional and social, social cognitive, physical, and language skills. When we observe children playing, we find a versatile range of expression. When children are in motion, they make sounds with their voices, their bodies, and material.
OK, thank you. So storytelling in an outdoor environment. Storytelling forms an integrated part of what happens in everyday foundation phase in classrooms. When a storyteller prepares a story, she should ask herself the following questions. What do I know how to use my voice? Do I use a pause for dramatic uh, effect? Am I static as I was already moving? Am I static or do I see my body to convey the, the message? Does my facial expression contribute to the storytelling? Does my enthusiasm show and do I enjoy my performance? Does the use of media enhance the telling or do visual aids hamper the, the story, the way you tell your story? Is my story suitable for the audience I plan it for? Will the story keep the audience captivated? Okay, so I'm not going to go through all these, but for now, I want my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Shop, to tell a story briefly. Then I will summarize how we can use that story uh, with music, drama, and art. Thank you. I'm just going to be used to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As my colleague has mentioned, I'll be telling a story. Though I will not tell you what the story is about, you will have to listen attentively. One day. Oh, OK. This, there's 71 people online. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One day, little Tatis was basking in the sun. As she was basking in the sun, she was looking up high in the sky. She was talking to herself, saying, I wish one day I could be afforded a chance to fly up high, to look at the world from a different angle. While Mother Eagle was flying up there, looking down, she saw that, ah, Totos is talking to herself. Let me go down because maybe there is a problem. So she flew lower and reached little totters. She sat on a rock a little bit further from the totters and said, totters, do you have any problem? Totters said, ah, not exactly, except that I have a dream. I wish one day I could be afforded a chance to fly up high and look at the world from a different angle. The eagle moved from the position she was in to look at Tata's direct in the eye and said, what does it have for me? Tata's looking amazed said, all the riches that are in the valley could be yours. The gold, the silver, the diamonds, you name it, it would be yours. Oh, that's great. Okay, let's ride on, said the eagle. The eagle opened the claws, grabbed Tata's, up they moved. Wow, what an experience for the tortoise. As they were up there, tortoise looked down and saw the friends and said, I wish we could fly lower, that my friends could be jealous of me. They've never had the experience. So the eagle flew lower and lower until she reached the ground. Immediately when they got to the ground, she opened her claws and said, I don't like people like you who would want the friends to be jealous. So now I'm leaving you. She then said, okay, it's time for you to pay. <laughs> 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 Laughed the turtles. Where do you think I would have all the treasures? I just said that because I wanted you to take me up high. Oh, really? Said the eagle. And furiously she left. The turtles were so happy to have seen the world from a different angle. The following morning, Mother Eagle came around again. 
Hi, Totos, said Mother Eagle. Hello, Mother Eagle, how are you today? I'm great, and how are you? Did you enjoy our ride yesterday? How could you ask? Yes, it was wonderful. Would you like a ride today? Yes, please, I would appreciate that, said the little tortoise. Ride on, let's move. So the tortoise, I mean the eagle again, grabbed tortoise, off they flew. Tortoise started asking herself, how would she be so kind to come back for me after what I did yesterday? And she said, uh-uh, the best way to, uh, to find out is to ask. So she said, eagle, do you have that much of a good heart to come back for me even today? And Mother Eagle said, watch the space. See what I'm going to do to you today because of what you did yesterday. The eagle just opened the claws. Mm -hmm. The little turtle said, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> until she got to the ground. Fortunately, because of her hard shell, she didn't get injured. So the friends came around to check what was happening to their friend. Are you hurt? She said, oh, I'm still not too sure. Mm -hmm. And then an older tortoise came to say, it is good to dream. But before you take action, do consider the consequences. <laughs> Thank you. OK, just to sum up, the issue here is you don't have to sit in a classroom and tell the story. You can take the kids outside, outdoor storytelling. Then you tell the story. Thereafter, you ask you ask your children to dramatize. That is when we are going to use drama, to dramatize what we have just told them. And you assist the kids, you help them to pick the scenes that they can dramatize, then they play. And next, I'm just rushing through my slides. Then music, you can also pick some important scene there and you let the kid sing about the story. Either you can use music as your introduction or at the end. After they've listened to the story, then they can start singing about it. And as a teacher, you can improvise and even coin your own story, your own songs from traditional songs. And also you can even make instruments because they are outside, they can collect grass and take papers and make a collage or paper machine, whatever, using the locally available material. The problem is most of the time we tell stories indoors and we complain that we don't have toys, we don't have teaching materials, yet you can use the scenery outside, the naturally available material. So you can lastly ask the children to draw what they've heard, what they've listened to, and or paint whatever based on the story. In other words, we have used all the methods, storytelling, music, drama, play, at once. It might not be a one day a project. It could be a week, two, or even a month, depending on what you want to emphasize. So let's say theme of the week is about this. So you start from performance, practical, music, tell the story, then the action, what we have already told them. Thank you. May I invite Brazil to present? Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, it's uh, so nice to have. Um, well, I have to do this, right? Yeah. Oh, there, there, there is our grandchild, uh, Caetano, and a horse as a baby. So that tells um, about um, me uh, relearning some of the 
magical first years. And here he is <laughs> in a boat exploring the ocean. He lives by the ocean in Brazil. So um, I'm so glad we're having uh, such different perspectives. I'm afraid mine is going to be quite serious. <laughs> Not sure our persona dolls will enjoy this so much, but I thought it would be nice to share with you um, some reflections about what it means when we talk about decolonization. And a lot of that comes um, from African countries um, and very importantly from uh, my part of the world in Latin America. And so I will look at these two uh, different perspectives here. Um, a little bit about what we mean by that in, now, um, in Latin America, and then use the SIP project and the ICCRP project. I'm part of both, proudly. Um, how some examples of uh, how we are trying to tackle. Uh, decolonial perspectives in in practice. So very quickly, um, in the 90s, a group of scholars, mostly, they were philosophers, social scientists, historians, started created this group called Modernity and Coloniality Group. And uh, the Peruvian sociologist Aníbal Quijano came up with this concept of coloniality of power to talk about continuity of similar forms of domination and power relations after the end of colonialism produced by colonial cultures and structures of the capitalist system. So um, after that, lot, many um, different discussions, uh, the idea of decoloniality became quite strong to mean um, attitude, an attitude after you become really conscious of that uh, part of our history, particularly coming from the perspectives of those who were colonized like us by the Portuguese and so many others in many parts of the world, but also those in the northern countries who were um, who brought the imperial forces and the colonial um, power relations. So decoloniality, I just picked one of our uh, scholars from Argentina, Mignolo, and from Colombia, Escobar, who um, talked about the colonial thinking as a particular kind of critical theory, a kind of epistemic disobedience. Um, or the idea of the, the oppression that Paulo Freire brought so uh, strongly to us in the pedagogy of, uh, of the uh, oppress oppressive. So decoloniality reveals the dark side of modernity and how it is built on the backs of others. Others that are racialized, silenced, erased, and or objectified. So the whole idea of thinking in on the colonial lens is to uh, restore, elevate, renew, rediscover, and then acknowledge the multiplicity, multiplicity of lives, life experiences, knowledge coming from all kinds of other groups that were silenced and oppressed. Um, now I'll bring it to thinking um, connecting it to children and young people. Um, and I, I chose two points here. First, we all know that there has been a lot of knowledge construction about childhood in the past three decades and pretty much um, stimulated by um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child and then all the change in the legislation and policies in our countries around the world. So a paradigm shift that brought this idea of children as subject of rights. That's changed so much the way 
uh, children started uh, being viewed. There is a second point is a growing critique of the knowledge construction about childhood. The idea of the global child decontextualized and deterritorialized, whose model derives from knowledge production and conceptualization of the child coming from northern countries and Eurocentric perspectives. That was the main critique. There's many, many authors discussing that. In and in short, knowledge construction about childhood still lacks a clear decolonial perspective. It really does, and, and that's what one of the efforts in um, ICCRP working group discussing theory and concepts. We have been really um, plunging ourselves into that discussion, engaging uh, people from various parts of the world. Um, so um, in, in number two, looking at the colonizing approaches to research now. So we came to young people. Now we're talking about research with. When you talk about research with children, we are already deconstructing the idea that children are objects and we look at them and then we describe what they are and what they think uh, by the way they beha behave. Um, but also, we as researchers do a lot of uh, work on, on um, knowledge production about children. And we don't want to do that anymore without having um, changing our own attitude in terms of how we listen, how we understand, and then how we document all this knowledge. That deconstruction in some ways could be seen as decolonizing knowledge but not everything is decolonization. Not everything is decoloniality. I'll come back to that. So looking at the two projects, SIP and ICCRP, in SIP we have been looking at very young children, very challenging how we listen, how we dialogue with a two, three, four-year-old. And in ICCRP we have been looking at um, more like teenagers and youth, in action in defense of children's rights. In Brazil, we are looking at their agency. We don't use, really use that term in, in Portuguese or Spanish, but they are being uh, protagonists or being um, um, proactive, a leader sometimes, not always, in spaces of policy deliberation. Now I'm gonna be focusing on young children and the SIP project. And this is um, a view of our community, the community where we have been working with neighbor uh, to um, to my university. I now uh, realize that I didn't introduce myself, but it was written here, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, Rocinha is in the same neighborhood of the Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, where I teach and where CESP, the International Center for Research and Policy on Childhood, also uh, is based. Um, and here is a, a view of the houses. I wanted to show this, that about um, the similarity of um, all these um, different wires exposed and all the possible dangers. The only difference is that we just don't know why we don't have fire there, but uh, that's uh, perhaps something to further explore later, but it's so dangerous for obvious reasons and the, the density is just so uh, big. So uh, in this community, we have been uh, developing different ways of listening to children uh, from three to six, basically, in this uh, study. And we have been developing some uh, methods, and there are some principles that I want to share with you. One is creating spaces for listening, and we have been exploring different kinds of spaces, but these spaces, they have to be marked and um, the word in Portuguese, the term here, espaço de delicadeza, I can't really um, translate this well in English, but it's spaces that are delicate, that are sensitive to 
the children to feel safe, to feel comfortable. The same effect the persona doll will give to the children to feel they are engaged, that they are part to produce to promote attentive and respectful listening, observing and interacting. We are talking about adults all the time interacting with children. So we are um, in a space where different generations are there and we are trying to talk respectfully, not to us become children or the children become adults, but how can we talk in a respectful way? And in the same lens, how can you document this without putting our adult views, perspectives and words all the time? That will happen to you, but how can we minimize that? Here is um, an example of in the process of consulting the 30 children in um, in this our community, we um, we thought of different ways of using toys to mark the space and the, so the children when they got in there. Oh, it's a space a space to create, to talk, to 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 tell stories, to do whatever you want. But also uh, we here had some questions to trigger their imagination and the adults here are some of the interns and the people that were trained to interact documents not just sit there they are sitting here but they it's more like action research in 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 brazil that's what we would call that the second um example i wanted to give you is the creation of the trupe brincante also different to translate but I think we came up with this term um, use um, play leaders. So it's training some residents from the community. They are young people who grew up in this community and never thought of themselves as being able to, to be interacting with children. That was not their idea. And, and most of them did not told us that they were didn't have the experience of having adults telling stories to them when they were little children. And so they learned how to do that um, first, going back to their own childhoods and then thinking, what was my childhood like? Um, if, um, if I had the chance to, to listen to stories, how would I like that to be to happen? How can I do that with children? So here are some of the books that um, we selected together that had to do with our main concept, safety, inclusion, participation, but also um, books that would, they thought the young people, that the children would be very interested in. And here they are with the CSP team. Here's an example of one of the young uh, the youth from resident from Hosinga sitting with them and interacting and talking and telling stories um, together and all these uh, being uh, uh, also documented. So I would like to conclude with two points. One, I was in India in December and just walking in Dharanshala I saw a, um, I saw this sentence, and I, it it made me think about it all the time. And it said, "We do not inherit the earth from our parents; we borrowed it from our children." And it tells uh, so much about thinking with the colonial perspectives, because it tells us about something that's natural to children, which is this great interest, in natural things in plants, in animals, when they are very little and they talk to the plants and they talk to, to, to the animals. And we, we lose that as we grow older. I think only crazy people can do that, right? But then it's so important to remember now, I'm not saying anything that you don't know, but to, to, we have to remember perhaps that that is part of being a child. And 
it's not a, a new invention that we created that the connection to nature is important. We just have to remember that our indigenous groups, native peoples all had and still have that as a very important part of their lives. And I will end with a sentence by uh, Sak and Yang in a paper they wrote in 2012, so uh, more than 10 years ago. And um, they were they are based in the US, but they have in indigenous ancestors. And they say the following. Decolonization is not a metaphor. Not a metaphor. It is about consciousness and then action, attitude. And they warn us, and I, I, I take this very seriously because it's being used for everything now. If you want anything you want to deconstruct now becomes decolonization. And then we lose the true meaning of it for so many of the countries that have been oppressed. So the intensification of the use of the term, like decolonize our schools, decolonize methods, decolonize child research, becomes, turns into a metaphor, and that's not what we want. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The team. And now I would like to ask Nader to come along, our Palestinian colleagues, to present. I'm Nader Wahabi. I'm from Palestine. I work at Qatan Foundation. And I'm new in the project. Actually, I've been here since three months and I'm learning a lot from my colleagues. And I really appreciate Bethlehem University, Rabab, and my colleague Ahmed, who invited me to, to participate in the research project, which we are doing in, in relation to decolonization of knowledge in early childhood. And once you are asking, how can we decolonize knowledge in Palestine while we are under occupation uh, and and we are colonized. So we say that even there is a political colonization, we are still and have another co colonization, which is knowledge. And that's why we work on decolonizing knowledge in this area. Uh, I'm here to share my experience in pedagogies in uh, emancipatory research in Palestine from where I came from the Qatan Foundation. I, perhaps we can use this in our research uh, with the colleagues here in Bethlehem in the context of early childhood and all the uh, research areas that we are working on. Um, I'm a director of the unit of education, so we have early childhood unit trauma in education, project-based learning and science education. And I'm actually a scientist, but I can see the imagination world of the children and how, and how they act with science in, in, in early childhood. So I'm combining early childhood and science. Um, running fast through some uh, da data that we have, um, let me focus on how the sectors are uh, um, distributed we have uh, the early childhood sector in palestine is uh, uh, distributed in private sectors associations charitables and religious associations and lately the ministry of education are now adopting the early childhood in years five in order to prepare them for going up to uh, the first grade um and we at the foundation work in professional development. We call it in Arabic takawun. Development is a word also, some kind of, it's a colonized word because persons can develop themselves and the Arabic word is more empowerment rather than I develop you. So we are using this word in particular. In early childhood, we give, we work with kindergarten teachers and we have a course for a one year long 
with about 150, uh, 130 hours. Uh, having mantle of the experts, science in early childhood, storytelling, formative assessment, culture, and 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 so on, with the, with the with these um, courses that eventually they will uh, graduate and be in in the, in uh, while they are in service, they have the more um, empowerment to work with children. Um, let me focus on. Uh, um, specific methodology that we use, which is, uh, let me skip this, uh, which is drama mantle of the expert. Um, and drama, as I say, is uh, is the word of the child because imagination and and as Edward Bond is saying, the the child is dramatic in nature. So. We bring the world outside, inside the classroom, rather than going out, which is, I'm, I'm, it's a different world. So um, we were using Vygotsky and Bruner's uh, the theory in this methodology, because, because we are into integrating as an art-based approach, and um, we use uh, we explore ex issues in the curriculum, and create fictional world inside the classroom where children become responsible for doing something. So it is a mantle of the expert as if there is a mantle that the children will be play a role of an expert doing something inside the classroom that is really uh, associated with something real outside the world. So it is drama as well because we are working um, in the world of ideology. That's why drama inside the classroom also speaks with ideology and will I will later on talk about this in in a, in more uh, elaborate way. But when we work with the kindergarten teachers, we work with them as a as a researchers because research is part of their professional development. So we use participatory or slash emancipatory action research. Um, and we believe that if 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 you provide the kindergarten teachers with new methods, they will think about their old methods and they will also think about their ideologies and all the terminologies that they learn from the universities and look at them in a different way. So action research is a very important part as a context of the whole project. Um, and I will give more examples, but this is a more theoretical background of mantle of the expert because it contains inquiry, drama, and mantle of the expert approach, where in the middle learning happens, where we where all the the ideology comes through. Um, so, our, uh, uh, kindergarten teachers, as researchers, work in new methodology in order to think about themselves and about the children. And you, you will see also how the children express themselves in terms of safety, in terms of participation through the dramatic world. For example, this uh, we, uh, kindergarten teachers use stories a lot in their in their uh, classrooms. So one of the famous story, and I quote here from my co uh, colleague Costas uh, Amopoulos and David Davis from. Uh, uh, the world of drama, they they give this example, and I will give more examples later on. And when you use this story, the wolf and the seven little kids, um, there is a chance for the kids to talk in a safe way about the mother and why she told her goat kids to be safe and to lock the doors over and not to let anybody get in. And when you ask the children, what do you, why do you think the mother did that? And they come and propose many things that if you ask them what the meaning of safety, maybe they don't articulate a little more, mm -hmm. or maybe they can uh, uh, they provide uh, experiences from their life through the story. This is why the storytelling is very important. So uh, all the ideology of the mother and why it's uh, it's she's thinking about safety and how the children understand safety gives you an perspective about safety as well. So this story becomes a mantle of the expert where we ask these children to play ro the role 
of the goats and to protect their home. So they use materials, they use uh, fictional uh, imaginative technologies, let me say, in order to protect uh, the home of the of the goat from the wolf. And the, the, this is why they become an expert in, in protection. Another story that we, we love and use is the Goldilocks and the Three Bears by Robert Southey, where uh, the girls here in the pictures sleeping in the bed of the of the three of the smallest bear, and she ran away when she woke up, and and we say why she she ran away, and let's think of how we can invite her to the to the house, and they think of how they can make the place more attractive to to young children from the other uh, human being. And um, and we ask questions, and this is really ideological questions. Why do you think that the ch this child is coming and, in and interfering with our life and eating from our food and so on? So they become and talk more about from their experiences in their real life, and they getting it into the story and they live it. We call it in drama metaxis where there is a real life and there is a story and these children are in between. And this is the final story, which I love, which is about the dolls, uh, the hidden house, uh, where there are dolls and there is an old guy who built the dolls from wood and who, he protects them and loves them and always putting them on the window. And, and, so, and once in a time he left and he didn't come back. So the dolls stayed on the window waiting and waiting and waiting and all the seasons comes and we ask the children why do you think he left so they because the children live in a situation where they lose friends they lose families so they talk about him and they put all their experience in their real lives uh, into the story and then we ask them okay so how we can make the dolls happy so they are they for example, in one of the examples that we work with the children, they propose to help them bring more dolls in order to be happy. So they become became uh, uh, doll makers and in different fashions and just to play, to make decorate the place again because it was ruined from all the time that the man left. So this is drama, storytelling and ideology, and perhaps we can use it inside the our research in order to understand what the world the the big words that we are using, participatory and safety in, in the, the words of the uh, children. And thank you very much. Thank you so much and a huge thank you to our whole team. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here in person and with you all online. Um, big thank you to Wida, to Lucy, to Kay, to Malabongwe and Rene and SK and Dodo and Nadir and, and their teams. There's many people who are working with them within the, across the countries. Also to everyone behind the scenes. Um, there's always tons of people helping out with tech. We have fabulous research assistants from the ICCRP project with us in person, um, Sheldon and Sachi, who just arrived from Ontario and Canada and Tyrese and Molly, who's online um, from Edinburgh, helping with some of the questions and answers. So thank you to everyone and all of you who are here in person and online. It's wonderful to have this hybrid opportunity. We're now gonna open the floor to questions um, and we invite those both online and in person if you have any questions to share. Wonderful, yes. Okay, I have a genuine one, but um, yeah, so something I wrestle with, so I'd love to know your opinion, that when we use particularly things mm -hmm. like storytelling or drama, et cetera, which are so powerful working with mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. um, I would say they tend to encourage imagination or creativity mm -hmm. and playing roles. When we apply that to research, does it matter in terms of so when I work with some children, you know, they you can they if they're not saying something that's actually from their experience, but it's something that they're imagining and creating. 
So I think it, when we apply these things to yeah. research, when we're trying, say, to find out about key concepts, et cetera, yeah. how do we actually kind of deal with that wonderfulness about the imagination and creativity yeah. when I guess what I'm saying is, frankly, we are we're, we wanting to yeah. almost sort of have an entry into their, their mm -hmm. lives and thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Kay has asked a question a bit around the application of sort of these participatory play and arts tools to research. And what does that mean as an entry into exploring children's lives? Does anyone have a response to that? OK, I, um, from drama perspective, um, drama is a way to uh, create a world where you can protect children. We, we call it a safety distance where they can talk freely about the doll or about the uh, situation that they are working with and expressing the real world in different ways. So um, we think that it is a protection kind of protection from the research. And uh, also it's a safety zone for them to talk about something that they might not talk about and they might be afraid of talking about uh, or may they are sad to talk about. So they have to protect children from the research. And I, we think that it is a good way to work through the, th with them actually, and with the kindergartens teachers to see how research is working in a different way in an arts based approach. So this is my perspective of, from your answer. Wonderful, thank you. Does anyone else want to respond? I think um, I would go back to the challenge of documenting as researchers. Um, in our case, in the SIP project, we wanted children to talk about very complicated concepts, safety, participation and inclusion, which is confusing to a lot of us and um, in different contexts and in groups within our contexts, they mean different things. So we keep discussing this. What is the best way to do it in a respectful way? That meaning that we are not putting words into the children's mouths because we saw something and we interpret. Some of that is inevitable. We are adults, we have adult eyes. But if we question ourselves all the time about it, we can try some strategies like giving the children their own drawings and asking them, you know, instead of us giving a title to that drawing, what, what is this? And then they surprise us all the time because what they are talking about is not what we are seeing necessarily. Um, it, very, um, obvious examples we um we the, in this community there is a lot of killing so there is blood they are used to seeing blood so if everything is red they are not necessarily talking about blood we we obviously want to see that as well it might be something else completely different or it might be that and then perhaps they are ready to talk about it and if they are not they won't say anything and we have to understand that that's a very touching issue. So all the, all these delicate aspects of being a researcher um, using, again, some approaches that uh, deconstruct our the ways even we, we were taught in the university. if you've got questions that you want to pose but also experiences that you want to, to share from your own work or research with children please uh, we'd love to hear from you thank you thanks Lucy so my question really is sparked by you know what you shared and, and the stories that everybody's been saying and and obviously you you are eliciting strong emotions you're talking about very sensitive issues you know these children are in fragile or vulnerable god if you want to mm. call it but and they're exposed to all sorts of things and so how do we deal with that as part of research and our responsibility as researchers and being ethical about the research we conduct so at what i mean what kind of mechanisms and safety protocols to be put in place to deal with that because i can imagine it can 
it can be quite delicate and it can be quite difficult. Um, so I'd just like to hear from the different groups um, how they've dealt with that in their research. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think to try and answer your, your question, Kay, I think from our perspective, it does speak to the limitations of the research methods and because it's something that we're exploring, we're learning. And and I think it, it means that you must um, uh, be very inquisitive in terms of how you engage children. For, in, for an example, I think one of the pictures that we show we showed children was a picture of a child that is lying in the dark alone. And when we asked, what do you think is happening? And 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 she, one of them said, the, ch the child is crying because the uncle beat her up. So we try, we asked, uh, does your uncle beat you up? And, and, and there was no clear answer. So it meant that we should uh, at least engage with that child and understand, and also with the preschool teacher to understand if there are any instances and situations where that, that particular child could be in danger. It appeared that, uh, you know, it was just an expression of uh, what she, the world that she's exposed to, not particular something that she, she experienced but because she exp exposed to situations of violence and, 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 and as such. So, so it means that you must also, you know, come back and, and, and address those and ask the question again so that you understand whether this is out of imagination or is it, it is out of experience. Yes. Previously, at the job. And one of my big concerns with the planning the project and thinking about engagement with children is really to put safety mechanisms in place as well. We don't spoke about high levels of violence that children are exposed to, but we also know that children are exposed to incredibly high levels of family violence within the home. And therefore, what Mali Gordon is describing, it could have been very real. We know that nearly mm -hmm. A third of children have been exposed to sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. So when a child discloses that in stories or that, one, particularly in our context, you know, it is really important then to think about how do you ensure children's safety? So the ethics of something we die is based around ethics of how to conduct research safely with children, particularly. In, in research contexts where you're exploring issues that they might not fully understand and comprehend what they're disclosing. So I think in, in, in the context that we live in, it's incredibly difficult because we have to think through what are those safety mechanisms that you've got to ensure that if a child does disclose them and if it is happening, what do you do? Because it could mean a removal of that child to ensure the child's safety. Yeah. Mm. So, so I think it's not straightforward and it's not mm. simple. Um, and I understand certainly that we want to explore concepts, mm. but as researchers, you also don't want to do more harm. Um, thank you very much. This is such a so much complexity, and when we're we're exploring safety and research with children and what that means ethically. Just, um, I'm not sure if we can ask if anyone online can hear people in the audience, or would you like me to repeat? You feel free to message, um, but I'll just summarize, not as eloquently as you've spoken to, is that the critical issues around, um, Shanaz highlights sort of the safety mechanisms and that many children are exposed to violence within the context. About one third are exposed to sexual abuse. And really, we have to explore how we're ensuring those young people's safety when they're sharing their stories and the ethical complexity of what that can look like. As because if they share something, then how do, are we responding and what's our responsibility um, and duty of care within those spaces? Um, did I summarize that all right? Ah, wonderful. Thank you. And I see, do you have a reflection you'd like to jump in with? You're welcome to come up or I can repeat. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Children, yeah. 
in Cape Town is impressive as well. I think it's very clear from this whole the presentations that there's a lot of this field. I mean, we don't do research, we actually put flats on giving form. But there's no doubt that sort of storytelling to art to drama is something that's critical that that build that trust. And that works in business. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The problem is, and uh, this question has is coming now, the, the ethical considerations we have to take. Yeah. Because once you open one the key that decides to express the self of yourself, mm -hmm. then you have to have a group of people that have the skills and the resources to be able to deal with the aftermath of that situation. Yeah. And I think that's when sometimes you see things go a wrong research situation. Uh, I, I, I think we have to be extremely aware that uh, we need systems in place. Mm -hmm. If you are in a particular culture, in a particular situation, and a child brings a particular issue, beforehand you need to be very aware that we need to have somebody that can deal with that situation there. And if not, somebody that can deal with that situation very short term, mm -hmm. in quite urgent way. Because if not, I have seen things going on. Mm -hmm. and, and, I think, uh, and I think it can happen. The other, the last comment I want to make is that some, some of you have been made as one of the presenters, is how critical it is to involve the child in the analysis of that mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. analysts can analyze whatever they want, yeah. but mm -hmm. many times they are wrong. That's a bit the most mm -hmm. skills that yeah. they are in their field of research. And a particular drawing, a particular story, a particular tale, if you ask the kids themselves as a group to Going depth into that is fascinating. The type of that, have, that are sometimes very different from seeing a particular drawing and you say this happened to this child. Mm -hmm. So that's what you thought. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so for those online, we had reflections around um, how these. These methods are, aren't only research methods, but are used in other forms of practice as well, and yet they help to elicit trust. And how when we're building trust, we need to be reflecting deeply as well. What does that mean? What types of stories are being shared? And what do we have in place to effectively respond? And what's our, our duty that looks like? Something we've also been talking about with a couple as a team earlier this week was also the responsibilities of what support systems do you have in place for the researchers themselves? Because sometimes the children are, are quite comfortable sharing their stories and the researchers aren't quite prepared. And so what does that look like? And what type of supports exist for everyone involved to be able to effectively respond in those spaces? Um, and then the man as well, the audience also highlighted participatory data analysis. How are children involved in the data analysis process? and in like reflecting on their stories. And that's something, you know, as the team's starting to get into, we'll be exploring more. It's something a few of us on the team have done much of with um, older children to have them involved in reviewing the data, the key themes, being part of the analysis process and really critically looking at what are the themes emerging, not just from an adult lens, but in partnership with children. And um, I'm gonna let the, um, the presenters respond and then I'm gonna see if there's any questions online. Yeah, I just you just yeah. picked up on a really important yeah. point um, in relation to the assessment of safety, making yeah. sure that there are mm. experts in the room or that mm. there's a referral process. Mm. And often with older children, we'll actually um, with either teen advisory groups or our participatory mm. researchers, you're able to do and create a, a risk assessment and mitigation strategy before you start your research, which can be, it can expand mm -hmm. the, um, you know, or, or help you to define actually what the, the risks are and what are not. So we did uh, a project where we were working with 
um, children from one of the areas in Cape Town. <laughs> It'll come back. We vote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, they, all of the pictures that they drew, there were um, but people had guns, but that wasn't the story they were telling. Mm. That was just the background to their lives. It was a common feature. So the, those advisory groups where the older children are able to identify some of the areas where there are risks to quantify it and to help think through what you need to put in place. But my question to you is the, the SIPS team, you were working with very young children who, I mean, I as a researcher wouldn't use that as a methodology, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily ask, you know, early years children about those risks of, of safety, etc. So how do you, how did you have that conversation? You know, did you do it with the parents? Did you do that yourselves? How did you put that piece in, in place at the start of the, the project? Because it's it's part of that continuum. So you were about to spring up and answer. <laughs> uh, just one comment. Um, oh, I believe that we as researchers need to think about the ethical research as well uh, in, in a way in a contextualized way, or what we call decolonizing also research, not only the... Because in Palestine, when we t you, when you tell somebody, ah, oh, don't worry, I want to use your name, they say, why? Mm -hmm. I want to use my name. Mm -hmm. And I think it's different from different countries. So mm -hmm. this is one issue that we need to think about it. What I presented actually is, is a professional development, not a research wait for the kindergarten teachers to think of their profession uh, in a research way. And if we are going to use it and we will use it, we will need to think together about the uh, ethical issues and how we can agree or contextualize these issues in a different in a different way. And yes, Rabab, please, I, I heard that you, you can come can talk about the research. to do is you know all parents they know when there is something wrong with their children sometimes this uh, the culture of silence is and the lack of tools and even they don't want the children to be talking a lot in our case trust building with the community even parents con contacted us why don't you use the tools to because we cannot act, you know communicate with our children to talk about these issues and I believe this is the purpose of research. It's not to to to, to give me rank in my university in Palestine. Sometimes I really, in, in many cases, I stop my research and I return it back to the community in order to protect children by providing the resources that should be done. So this is our ethics is sometimes you say, no, it shouldn't be published. It should be published verbally to, um, to, to their community. So, so, you know, I think we need to, as Nader said, decolonizing our minds as researchers and working with children to be very fixed and structured in a way that we need anything happening. Yes. Children should be published and should. should uh, uh, so this is, yeah, I mean, I work in sex education where now our children are exposing a lot of issues and immediately we talk to parents, we say, um, what if when your children are talking about uh, these subjects and they came with perfect tools by sharing experiences because each one had their tools without telling others. But when they started to talk and we brought someone who's expert in sex education within our approach of emancipatory mind, not the conservative view to sex education and protection, it really helped create a, a now group of empowered women in my context mm -hmm. To start even to raise it, to do a campaign within the BFG camp to end violence, including sexual and psychological uh, violence. So I think we really need to rethink about our own, really to free our minds from the rigid way of seeing research. Thank yeah. you very much, Rabab. Um, and just for those online, we're checking to see if people can hear, but Rabab has very eloquently spoke to really critiquing the westernized obsession with academic publications and 
looking at emancipatory ways of looking at, at research and how are we decolonizing our minds and really focusing on safety of children or what's more important. So if you're doing research and an issue emerges, you're not thinking I need to publish that. You're thinking how are we responding and supporting and addressing this with the community and things like publications come second, but the respect and care for the young people in the communities comes first. Um, oh, another question from the audience or comment. And those online, please do share and please do come up. And that way, that way we can hear from you. And instead of me summarizing, although hopefully I'm summarizing all right, but if um, I want to ensure, would you like to come up? You don't have to, but would you like to come up? All right, I have a repeat. <laughs> She's got a line. <laughs> across the wall. Christina, the Children's Commissioner in this province. Mm. Um, so my question, I think, is, mm. Let me reflect. Mm. My hardest job yeah. is not to hear children's voices. Mm. My hardest job is not to get trust from children to yeah. share their lives and their stories mm. and make an impact and, and dream of better realities mm. for themselves. Mm. My hardest job is to convince adults to listen. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. And the adults who, in my, in my milieu, the adults who I want to listen yeah. Or parliamentarians, mm -hmm. policy makers, mm -hmm. sometimes community leaders, yeah. parents. Yeah. Those are the power brokers in children's lives. Yeah. And how to get them to listen to the authentic voice mm. of children yeah. without saying you're being disrespectful. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a hierarchy of power in society that needs to be maintained for order to happen, you know. So uh, I think my, my question would be. Uh, to give me some tips. How do I get stubborn adults to listen? Thank you. Thank you very much. So we um we're pleased to have the uh, the children's commissioner of the province highlighting the hardest hardest problem is um actually having adults listen to children. Children are much able to speak as we know, but really having adults effectively listen and what do we need to do to shift those stubborn ways? Um, and I just want to check and then I'll pass it right to you. Um, is if there's any questions online? Yeah, yeah. There's a whole bunch of great. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start with this question here is too well, often while we have while we involve children in research, we rarely after our research tell them about what the research has found. So lest we be accused of being data robbers. What are the plans in place to inform children about the results in ways which they can understand? Well, you know you're doing something wrong. Does anyone want to respond to that? I can't even just talk to you. It's fine. Go back. Yeah. And if you are um if you're unmuted but you're not asking a question, please mute yourself and then you're also welcome to speak out loud. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin with such complex issues, but they are so important in, in Brazil as well. Um, true. Um, parents, but also the judicial system, they are by law supposed to listen to the children, even if they are young and they are. Um, they just don't understand it. They don't do it. And so. Um, they have approached us to to think about um, national training. Um, it takes time. I think we have to understand that uh, this is all so recent. After so much time of the the whole idea of the the biopsychological uh, children as objects of research and everything else, so it, it will take time. And I th I think we have to to persist. Now, as to returning to the data, it's not only to the children, but that's a very important point. Most researchers don't even return to their own people that they interviewed, uh, especially if they are, say, um, undervalued socially. In, in, for example, even parents who are not bothering to return. So we uh, have this as a main sacred principle in our center. Everything we do has to be returned. And we try to first publish um, in, a, in a way that can reach a very broad audience. Like our first uh, publications in this project are for the community. We have published eight um, um, like bulletins 
in about what they told us. We interviewed 60 people in this community and parents and teachers, directors, the children. So we are um, returning the like the highlights of the data back to them. But that's not enough because not everyone will read this. So we print them and distribute them widely in the community. We have to sit with them. So we invite them in different sessions to come and talk to us. Now, the very difficult question about the very sensitive issues that is particularly happen inside the home. There are, I think, two levels there, two types of silence. One is when um, young people bring us information that might cost their lives, in, like the drug trade. If they say something, they will get killed. We have to know that. When we have to not use that, we have to talk to the community and we have to handle to them these issues. How you think this can be useful, used what to protect the children, not us. We have to contain ourselves. And very uh, young children, I think when and, and other children that bring uh, issues, for example, of uh, violence in the home or sexual abuse, the teachers in Brazil are trained to learn about the protocols of protection. There are services, they are not perfect, but they exist. And uh, we have to be extremely careful because that can also cost the children being taken, removed to an institution and sometimes get lost in the system. If, if you expect their life to change, they will be there forever. So we have to be so aware of the consequences of our data and what how Rabab said, perhaps, it, who are we serving? That's a, a question, who are we serving? And sometimes uh, we have to lose, <laughs> you're not going to get a credit or something. We depends on, on, on uh, what uh, we think it's ethical and it's fair and it's human, it's decent to do with what uh, we learn and bring the people that know how to deal with those situations. Bring and 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 talk to them. And that's not necessarily a child protect protection officer that can run immediately in the home and take the child away or imprison the father. It's first we have to talk to the community, bring perhaps other experts that we know have a, a, a broad understanding consult with people and then uh, see what would be the best way to to respond so not just to be uh, omitting ourselves as well so very very complex very difficult but it's part of our job isn't it thank you very much Irene. um so wonderfully spoken and you also addressed one of the questions that someone had prior around you know what how how are you responding and what does that look like and and what are some of the complexities um the next quite the next online question is really around in context where the participatory data collection method is a needed one but the resources don't exist um what have teams been doing and i know that Eswatini team spoke to using local materials for creating instruments and tools um how are other teams addressing this where they want to be using participatory approaches but maybe there's not resources to do so um creative examples we use what is available mm -hmm. exactly they're using what is available yeah exactly yeah. yeah yeah never think that we need yeah. ready labeled uh, yeah. games brilliant they use what's available play can be created and constructed out of so many things um and so you don't necessarily need lego you can be using water different um materials from nature from land it's so that's what teams have been using as well and I think just to add that in, in our context, the, the advisory group that we have set in the community mm. has really appreciated the fact that we managed to set an advisory group. And they are saying for the first time uh, in ages, we are coming together and thinking of solutions. And we are mm. thinking of an action plan that will be informed by the findings something that the community can continue to act on and uh, and and come up with we are sharing findings and coming up with ideas of action 
so which is which is quite cr critical for that particular community. Thank you. We have just about another 10 minutes for a few more questions. Um, I do want to ask one question. Uh, Irene spoke to how decolon how um how it's decolonization is not a metaphor and it's about a consciousness and action. And we can lose the true meaning when we kind of toss around the word. And so I'm I'm questioning when we speak around decolonizing participatory methods um, with researching with children and young people, what are the opportunities of using the terminology and what are some of the potential challenges um, that you feel exist? And Irene, that's for you and anyone else who wants to answer that. Anyone else? Where challenges? I mean, everything that was raised yeah. today, it, it's about answering your question. Yeah, yeah there are, are different. Yeah. Um, oh, I think it's an amazing opportunity, actually, um, to first to um, problematize the use of the term. That's what I was trying. Um, to to say using the metaphor from uh, the sentence. Uh, so not to use the term in um, careless way. That's what I meant. Let's it's all about um, revisiting our histories. We know we're not going back to the past. Nobody wants that. That's not the idea um, or to uh, to be um, saying that we deny the progress in technology, the revolution in communication is all that is part of the of our world today. But all that can also give us the opportunity to raise awareness about some of those processes that are in place, and that uh, all the groups that continue to be oppressed and silenced, including young people, just because they are young. Working with our young people in the Children's Rights Council, they constantly say that they, they have to really um, learn how to take the microphone sometimes and say, you adults don't listen to anything. You don't even know the law. I know the law more than you do. <laughs> okay. And they do sometimes, see you know, oftentimes, and they and and say so you're not listening because you think we know nothing. We don't have life experience, you know nothing, but we we know more than you about certain thing, things related to our own ages. And that that's not all of that is decolonizing knowledge, but some of that is. That is also deconstructing roots of ways of looking, ways of behaving, ways of acting intergenerationally, because we are taller, bigger, stronger. It has to do with all those power relations that are there in society and those who are oppressed or silenced, because then they are not necessarily aware of that. They can have the opportunity to, with these discourses and description of practices to come and think, wow, I'm not going to wait to be considered a citizen in my country. <laughs> I want to understand why I am a sub-citizen, a, a third world country. I want to understand that and then be able to speak for myself. I think this great opportunity is that thank you for the question. <laughs> thank you so much, Irene. And Malcolm has a question or a comment as well. So let me play the role for a second of the ancient of days. The word participation has been running around in my head. And I thought, did I participate? No, I did what my mother told me to do. But then I went back to my academic training. In the 1960s, a US sociologist called Howie S. Becker wrote an article called Participant Observation. And what he did, he was a jazz player and he was a grass smoker. So <laughs> he tried to understand jazz by being a jazz player and watching what people did. 
he wanted to understand how people responded to grass. So he went to sort of new users and watched and realized mm -hmm. that two thirds of the effect were people imitating other people in terms of how they behaved, not their own chemical intake and their behavior. And following his example, I spent a week with seven colleagues in a children's institution to try and figure out whether or not the ch how the children responded to being in the institution, right? So there's a whole literature mm. that goes back a long time about how to extract more from a research situation by being an observer, by being a participant. And then I was thinking about all of our work and we visit schools, right? We train people to listen. But I wonder if any of us have actually nine to five sat in a preschool classroom for two weeks to be a participant observer in how the children were reacting. So two things, that later challenge, mm -hmm. and it might not be such a bad idea to go back to this research and learn about the techniques and pluses and minuses of being a participant in order to observe. Mm, action research. Yes. Thank you, Malcolm. So Malcolm is also a member of the uh, SIP team and is just speaking a bit more to reflecting on participation and participant observation, sort of that ethnographic model of what that could look like if in this research we're really taking that time um, to effectively engage in relation as a participant and as a member of an early year space. Um, and just to highlight, it's been interesting with this project in one of our conversations earlier today, participation has actually been one of the more complex terms for younger children and adults to really reflect on what that means and looks like in their everyday practice. So something for us to be thinking about when we're using these methods as well is um, what does that term even mean for people or how do they relate to it and connect to it? Um, and when is it just jargon and what does it mean and feel like to be a part of? Um, so recognizing we have about five minutes left and we really appreciate everyone online and in person who has stayed with us for these two hours. Um, we just want to introduce and our slides are now off so I'll speak to it but those online can see them. As we do have, this is part of a larger dialogue series. So as part of the International and Canadian Children's Rights Research Partnership, um, I'm really pleased to, to be a, um, a member of the participatory methodologies working group with Lucy, who you saw at the beginning, and Patricio, who's in the audience, um, and as well as our Irena and Kay are also both part of that steering committee as a larger team. And coming up, we have a conference dialogue series. This is the first. The next one is in September. Um, and we'll have specific dates that will come out, so do stay tuned. We also have a newsletter for ICCRP. I imagine Tara or others online can share details on that as well, and we can follow up. The next one will be in September, and that will be looking at anarchic and disruptive practices in decolonizing research with children and young people. Then in December, we'll come together again to look at why do we need to decolonize participatory methods in childhood studies and what epistemological approaches have merit. Then in April 2024, we'll look at who benefits from research beyond compensation, looking at reciprocity and human relationships in international research. And then to close, we'll come together and reflect on the review of the series in June 2024. What have we learned about engaging with participatory methodologies to decolonize research with children and young people? Now, all of these ones will have a few different panel members from around the world, and we're going to be inviting children and young people to be part of those discussions and dialogue spaces. Um, if anyone online or in person wants to contribute to any of those in any way, do let us know, um, and you can have the, we can create opportunities to see how you might want to be involved in those dialogue spaces, whether as a participant or a presenter or someone who shares ideas and questions. So thank you very much, everyone, and wishing you a wonderful day.